for an author that I am, everything fits in well in today's program. <coughs> Number one, I'm an entrepreneur, which not many people know. Number two, I'm an academician, which many people know. And uh, all of you at least know that I've written some books. Yeah. But you know, uh, it's a great event uh, over here at KLE and uh, BBD, and especially CTIE, because it's a combination of entrepreneurship, academic uh, partnership, and most important thing, you can see not only my books, but other books on entrepreneurship. So when the organizers, including my friend Mahesh, uh, he told me that you know you have to speak, I readily agreed because Mahesh has been promoting me right from Belgaum to Hubli. He makes sure that I come here at least one or two times a year. So the first question he asked us, sir, do you have a PPT? And the question should continues, where is my PPT? <laughs> and it's a technology summit, right? And then I said, let me not use a PPT even though I have one. Instead of having a PowerPoint, let me, let me at least have four, five powerful points about entrepreneurship. Number one, in entrepreneurship, challenges are fun. Challenges are fun. It is not saying, you know, I went to a venture capitalist and, you know, he told me your idea is not worth it. <laughs> you come back with a feeling and say, okay, my idea may not be worth for you, but you are a worthless, a worthless person. <laughs> it's okay, you know, our horoscopes don't match, but I will still get married. <laughs> I know of writers who are very proud, you know, they are all best-selling authors and writers, they are very proud of telling them, I probably will get into the Guinness Book of World Records. Why? Because I got rejected 46 times by publishers. <laughs> So when you go to make a pitch, and I'm sure everybody, there were 85 or sort of entries, and only 10 got selected. The remaining 75 said, no problem, there is another opportunity, right? <laughs> Never doubt your ideas. You can refine the ideas, learn from the, what presentation mistake did I make? And let me tell you, being an people, maybe on the funding side to some extent myself, we encourage a lot of entrepreneurs. We say, you know, probably you don't just talk about a business idea. You actually need to present it very well that he starts feeling it's my idea. <laughs> you know, the problem is that and we think that idea is mine and it will succeed. Whenever you go to a venture capitalist or a funder or investor, remember, your whole challenge is to make him feel that idea is his. <laughs> then you may have 100 crores to invest in, never know, he will start with 50 crores and probably in the mind he says, wow, what an idea, I want to actually invest 200 crores. So I have a challenge that friends, if you are rejected, if you don't get your first deal done, it's okay. But you stay, you know, get up in the morning again and say, okay, let me run. That, that's the spirit of enterprise in entrepreneurship. The second thing, which is very critical and especially for the intellectual community that is sitting over here, you know, entrepreneurship should be having its base on research. One of the reasons why entrepreneurs feel is that they get a great idea, but when you look at supporting with data, analysis, analysis they say, okay, Great idea, but but you know, let, let us build it systematically with numbers. They're not good at it. Great idea without support of you know a, a project report it will definitely fail day one. So what I'm saying is that spend your first one year, if possible, or at least six months in doing the basic research of a field. Here is where most of the companies which have grown have something called a department called not research, but R&D, research and development, isn't it? So if you want to develop your idea, you need to have a base in research. And therefore, I always say this, that uh, please partner with academicians and teachers of your particular field. So that's a very big cultural shift, I mean, I have seen in developed countries, and let's say US for an example, and India. In India, entrepreneurship means the next stage that you do after your academics, isn't it? So I've done my studies, I'm an engineer, now let me become an entrepreneur. It is not stage two of your life. It is stage two of a life where you take the first stage along with you. <laughs> so what you need to do is that when you become an entrepreneur, please come back to your professors and say, sir, can you refine the ideas? It is not two different worlds, it's an integrated world. <laughs> let me tell you, you know, uh, I was with uh, Sanjay sir and we were discussing on the breakfast table. If there's a problem to be solved in this particular city, how many of you actually involve not just the municipal corporation of the government, but go to a university like this and talk to your professor, sir, what do you think? And let me tell you, these are the brains of the city. Huh? 
they'll give you free advice. And these students unfortunately believe that the teachers are outdated. <laughs> After our course session, right? Why am I telling you this? In every good talk show in various countries, okay, and especially when I look at American TV talk shows, there are five panelists and one of them definitely has to be a university professor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, they have that intellectual rigor, they will do the R&D work for you and in India, beta, I'm your guru, your message, take all knowledge free. <laughs> So why am I telling you this, friends, that when you start a company that should have research on an ongoing basis, you succeed it, but how many people like Pawan come back and thank this uh, particular institution? So your, your uh, partnership with the academy should be lifelong. Because research is happening over here, they also come up with ideas, they also, that's a full-time job by the way, isn't it? So, second important thing. Third important thing, you know, I have done quite a few research on why startups fail. Now, that's more important. <laughs> why startups succeed is one part of it. And uh, you can actually go to my YouTube channel, Radha Krishnan Pillay. I have done around uh, 8 to 10 series on, on startups. So, I don't want to expand on that. But when we were doing, uh, especially our sample was Indian entrepreneurs, almost 90 to 95 percent fail. Now, that's a big number. Don't worry about that you can still be in that 5% that succeed, okay? So why do startups fail? There are various reasons for it, but I don't want to go into that, but one very key reason they fail is lack of mentorship. It's very critical, it's not about me. How many people can go to somebody more senior, more successful in entrepreneurship, and not just go and ask them for funds, but say, you know, sir, can you guide me? Don't worry, funding will come. When we go to somebody who's an investor, how many of us have that particular openness to say, sir, it's okay, you don't fund me, I am sure. But tell me, as somebody asked in this particular question also, okay, tell me, sir, what is that I can refine better? And this is where, you know, the guru, Sishya Parampara in this particular country is very strong. We actually don't believe that we need to get advice from others. Of course, we have formal structures called as incubation centers, right? That's happening. What is incubation center? You are nothing and here is a process system and people who have done it. So you go into that particular system, ask a question, they'll customize it for you and make you successful. But the question is that whether you're a part of an incubation system or no, the key question to ask is that do you have a mentor, a guru or a guide in the whole process? And guru is not only in the beginning stage, at every stage of your life, you should be a part of it. I have worked with hundreds and hundreds of companies. There's only one company that I know in this particular country and I hope there are many. In their official website, okay, when you look at the management team, if you look at the management team, I have found the number one person is not the chairman of the company, it's the guru of the company, it's a mentor. And the name of that company is called Shrey Infrastructures. Have you heard of this company from Kolkata? Shrey Infrastructure, if you go to their website, I was very surprised. I was there. We are doing an annual you know, project plan for them and all that. And I was very surprised that they said, here is this man, who gave us the idea about how to get into this particular field. He's very old, he's almost 80, 85, but for every annual general meeting he comes, we invite him. He's not a part of the detailing process, the chairman is different, but the person who gave us the idea is still with us for the last 25 years. He doesn't work for us. So if there is a person who has given an idea, give the respect to him to at least come to the board meetings. If he doesn't come, you have to go to him and say, thank you, sir. <laughs> so I've reached 25 years. It's very important. In our ancient Guru Sishya Parampara, you know, the, the teacher's job is not done when the students graduate. So for example, you know, Raja Ram has, uh, you know, completed the course and he's become a Raja. No, he'll be in touch with Vashishta Maharaj after this also. And it's Vashishta Maharaj's responsibility, the Guruji, to guide him and especially when he requires more guidance when in power. It's very important that your academic partnership should grow stronger and stronger every year. So don't just, you know, oh, we, 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 done, make in India, I'm made. <laughs> but don't forget the people who make, uh, made you, including your parents, by the way. <laughs> and one interesting thing about this particular country, which I'm going to touch upon, my next point is that, when you uh, start up a company, 
please understand you also create a culture in a company. So you know you as startups, you as entrepreneurs, you as founders have got a very big advantage. You can create the company and the culture of the company the way you want. I know of companies which don't believe in attendance records. They say it's okay, you work from home, you work from anywhere, it's good you don't come to office, I don't have space anyways. <laughs> but you work. So the beauty of creativity is that you can create the culture you want. It doesn't matter whether you're a two employee company or a 200 employee company. And by the way, it's not about government regulations, it's your decision. So that's the beauty of creativity. And let me also tell you that when you start a company, let's say in Hubli, or Karnataka or India, it will definitely be different from the companies that you create in US or UK, isn't it? But the cultural context is very different. For example, in India, you will not be called a great entrepreneur only if you make money. Of course, you should make money. You know, I have seen so many entrepreneurs who don't believe that they're building companies, they believe they're building families. So when an employee comes into you, they don't really another employee cost to the company, you know, typical financial report. And as uh, Sanjisa put it very nicely about teamwork, you know, we are a larger family. I know of an entrepreneur, uh, second generation entrepreneur of course, he's got uh, some 350 employee and he sits with the HR village every day for one hour every day, like he sits with the finance guy every day. And you know what, he knows every single thing about that particular person and his family, 350 members. He knows this person is the 32 years old, he has to get his sister married. <laughs> yeah. Imagine somebody knowing that detail. He knows that this man is with me for the last uh, so many years, he's been with my father, he's with me. He's 60 years old, he's got two daughters, he has to marry them. <laughs> He knows that this person has got a handicapped child and I need to create funds extra for them. I want to study a company called as Mother's Sons. How many of you heard about this? Okay, I was quite surprised. It's not a great brand in India, but it's one of the most role model companies in this particular country. You know how many people they employ? 48,000 people. <laughs> yeah, that's the number. And such a humble businessman and his attrition rate is below 1%. I said, how do you do it? I was like, I don't know, but you know, they're all my part of family. We enjoy it together, we eat together. So, you know, when you create that in an Indian cultural context, if you want to stop attrition, you need to start looking at those cultural values that connect to us. And let me tell you, people don't leave your companies only because of money. It's always an emotional connect, isn't it? People don't leave their companies, they actually leave their bosses and the attitude that they had towards their bosses, isn't it? So it's very important that think about these angles, the philosophical angles when you start making your own companies. Okay, the last point from my side is, if you're a successful entrepreneur, if you're a successful entrepreneur, you need to go and fulfill your second responsibility. And that is to create more successful entrepreneurs. <laughs> it's not about me, you know, I succeeded, very good. <laughs> oh, well, it did go to dogs. I am successful and I am the billionaire. And Hubli is an example of this one person and many persons like you who succeeded. Desh, right? Yeah. And he comes back over here and saying that it's my responsibility to give back to the city that I came from, isn't it? Yes. How many of you, now you are in the first stage of your life saying that I want to be an entrepreneur, but don't forget your roots. You have to go back and give it back. And many people are giving it back. Yesterday I was at Belgaum. <laughs> They're also saying thing, people migrate, people migrate, people migrate. No, let them migrate. That's okay, but let them succeed and come back and give in some different way. So it's a responsibility that you give back to entrepreneurship. Today you're struggling to make a company, but once a company is successful, how many more companies did you make successful? That's the question. And that's where India has to create an ecosystem of entrepreneurship. And they have to allow people to fail. And failure is not bad. Every time the child falls, the mother feels happy. Wait out, oh. <laughs> you should try it, no? Try it once again, try it once again. And as the management field, they say, faster your failures. It's better to fail now rather than failing after 10 years. Because if you fail now, you will lose only 10 lakh rupees. If you fail afterwards, you may lose 10 crore rupees, right? <laughs> so it's important that we actually build in a culture of entrepreneurship. The good part is that entrepreneurship as a culture has started in India. You'll be surprised from January to March, we are almost uh, you know, just two and a half months now. I have done more than 32 sessions in more than 25 colleges across India and speaking on entrepreneurship. 
I've been speaking about it for the last 15 years, but suddenly everybody is inviting and telling me, Oh, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, what happened? And then I suddenly realize, oh, this man called Prime Minister Narendra Modi, <laughs> he started something and said, Start up India! And everybody is like, suddenly active. It's good, it's good. But let me tell you some success stories. I'm talking about India as a nation. There are communities in this particular country which are entrepreneurial communities. The Marwadis, the Gujaratis, the Kachis. Study them. And their models are very successful, by the way. Huh? If you look at the case studies, unfortunately, they don't like to document too much. But I also tell them, please come and teach in these schools how to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> in a Marwadi community or Gujarati community, they create entrepreneurs. And let me tell you, an entrepreneurship is not necessarily a multinational company or organized corporate. I'll give you a model, uh, just as an example, how they create a chain of entrepreneurs. You know, in Bombay, there is this whole culture of uh, drinking tea and it is called cutting chai. You know, have heard about it? So they'll have the typical glass, mm, six rupees only. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was trying to understand that they are typically these poor Rajasthanis who come to Bombay, migrate. They are not very really educated, very labor class. And one of my friends was a very good observer of social cultures in a city. So in Bombay, I live in a place called as Mulund. <clears throat> it's a very uh, um, small suburb, very much in the city. So we once went to this chai ka cutting ka thawa, you know. And, then, and this guy tells me, you know, I have studied this guy's entrepreneur model. Which model is Chai Walega? <laughs> so they say, you know how much he earns? And this is many, many years ago. No, I don't know that he is a privileged customer of Kingfisher. <laughs> ah, that time Kingfisher was flying. Huh? <laughs> and look at which guy. So we saw this, this guy, you know, in some white dress, on a cycle, the chappal. Yeah, what do you mean he said so rich? Hey, you don't know what? I'll explain to you. Then we had that tea and I was walking. In Mullund, he's got 100 chai ka this thabas. How many? 100. 100? How? Then I'll tell you the model. This guy came from Rajasthan and he had a mentor. <laughs> and his mentor gave him an idea. You know what is that idea? In Bombay, there is a lot of construction happening, right? And you know, like in India, a lot of infrastructure development is happening. But one of the biggest problem that we face is labor, isn't it? So we have migrated labor and all those things. And labor doesn't look at productivity, efficiency, time management, they look at daily wages. <laughs> okay? And one of the biggest excuses they used to give, the problem, you know, for the contract labor is that, you know, if they want at least two or three times chai in a day, isn't it true? So they want chai. Because the productivity will go down, they'll make an exit. So a lot of these labors, what is to do? Suppose it's a building construction site happening. So when it will become, you know, around 10 30 in the morning, oh chai pe char cha. So they will go somewhere and by the day a half an hour gone. <laughs> and sometimes after lunch and some of these, you know, these uh, labor contractors multiply, you know, half an hour by three times chai. One and a half hours. And my goodness, and multiplied, let's say, you know, 50 labors in one particular, uh, you know, building. So, this Chaiwala's mentor told him, I'll give So, instead of the labor coming down, I will take you to the labor and supply three times. They say, okay, only this much space, now do whatever you want, so much productivity, efficiency. <laughs> that business go, man. You know what is that? No real estate cost for him, no office requirement. <laughs> and provide it free. <laughs> And then he said, okay, his problem solved. He'll go around all the small, small little activities around that area, some offices, and say, I will come and deliver chai to you. And the business grew. Now the business grew, he can't handle it. There is another construction site happening. He goes and strikes a deal. He says, oh my goodness, see, now I got another opportunity. Can I put a chai katu? you very good. I heard about you doing it. Yahan bhi lagao. <laughs> now this guy doesn't have a, a workforce. He goes to native place, again a poor Rajasthan village, and he says, come, Bombay, Bombay, yeah. he'll come, and he'll train him to become an entrepreneur. Slowly over a period of 10, 20 years, he's mapped the whole Mulun, and you know what he does? Morning to evening, he doesn't tell size, chai. He takes a cycle, go and takes daily reporting. How much did you collect? <laughs> and each of them now is an entrepreneur by itself. 
If a poor, uneducated man can understand business dynamics in a small way, everything that you talk about, resources management, creating, it's all there. My dear friends, you need to give back entrepreneurship in a big way. It's not about you. And therefore, I'm telling you my story about entrepreneurship. Uh, my story of entrepreneurship is not, I'm going to tell you glory and everything. It just happened. Let me tell you, uh, I am a typical middle class mentality, all the stories you will hear. I used to work in Bangalore for a multinational company called as Voltel. And it was funded in the dot-com boom. Have you heard about the dot-com boom? Yeah, 1990s, all of the, you may hear about it. And then along with the dot-com boom came a dot-com bust. <laughs> so a lot of funders are useless. I don't want to keep opening websites. So I was a part of that company which was funded and also withdrawn from a dot-com. <laughs> and suddenly I remember actually in Bombay I was working in a company at that particular time. The salary was 7,500 rupees. Big for, and decent for those days. You know? And then suddenly uh, this Voltel was a company where Mark Mascrenus, the cricket tycoon, was funding it. He called me for an interview in Bombay and said, can you come to Bangalore? Why not? How much salary? No discussion. On a paper. He gives me uh, 35,000 rupees per month. And suddenly you are a what? From 7,000 you are making 35,000. Five times job. For an employee it's like a great job, isn't it? I came over here, but then the company uh, stopped and of course Mark